Great, thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, have been uh, invited to uh, talk about um, this particular topic and um, design uh, has been an interest of my, mine in, in safety ever since I got into safety, you know, which is far too long ago, probably nearly 38 uh, years ago. But I want to share with you some insights and some um, a bit of a journey uh, in that space. And hopefully when I get to uh, the end of our uh, discussion today, uh, convince you about um, the, uh, the importance of uh, design thinking uh, in our safety um, practices. Uh, I'm going to use a couple of tools uh, today, obviously very uh, keen to encourage uh, people to use the chat facility and um, I'll try and uh, interact with that um, the best I can. But I'm also going to use a couple of uh, forms which will be linked in the chat. So if you have the chat open, um, we'll be posting um, some links up uh, to the forms uh, to take some samples uh, from uh, the audience uh, that's uh, with us today. And we're going to open up with that, that discussion and I'm going to open up with a form and uh, you'll uh, get a link um, appearing in the chat uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, so uh, that, that is there now. It's come from uh, Sam. Um, and I really want to ask this question of, of everyone is, who are designers? In our thinking, in, you know, we're, we're working as a safety professional in organisations with lots of complex things uh, happening in that space. So it'd be really great if you could just open um, the short uh, form. And I'm really interested just to uh, sample a couple of questions. Now, I would emphasise that um, anything that you put into this form is completely anonymous. We have no knowledge of um, uh, who's uh, accessed the form and, <clears throat> and what um, answers are put there. Um, we're simply trying to get, get a bit of a perspective uh, from a group that's here today. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, there's two questions uh, that I'm keen to just sample uh, in this space. We're starting to get responses now, which is great. Um, and, and firstly, how important is design capability for the work of safety in your organisation? So it's a one to five uh, rating uh, in that space. And I'm also very keen to understand who you think designers are uh, in your organisation. You know, um, what, what role or what um, level of input as designers do this range of roles um, that we've put up there? And uh, we've asked a range of um, just from a, a group of people, people like senior leaders, uh, safety advisors, engineers, uh, some of the functional support, some technical people in that space. And finally, the third question I was interested in is, are work procedures and work methods a design product as such? Do we think of them as um, a product of a design um, process? So it's great starting to get some uh, uh, responses uh, up there. Um, and you should be able to access the responses. Um, there's a, there'll be a link at the end of where you can see the, the output that's coming here. So um, we've got uh, about 20 responses so far, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk to those um, and please keep populating them uh, as, as we go. Uh, they're starting to come through now quite, quite uh, strongly. That's helpful. Um, so it's, it's interesting. So far on our first question about how important design is the work of safety in organisation, it's coming through quite strongly as being important. Um, predominantly responses uh, um, are falling into uh, the four to five uh, ranking out of the one to five um, scale. Um, and uh, then looking at um, the, uh, it's interesting, lo looking at who are designers in your organisation um, and uh, this pretty strong response um, is that senior leadership, you know, um, have a, um, a fairly significant uh, role uh, as designers. Safety leaders have a significant role as designers. There's a bit of a spread on safety advisors uh, from um, having um, a commitment to, to some people feeling they don't have, have a role. Um, engineers, there's a bit of a split there, but fa fairly strong uh, response saying that they are involved in, in design in some way. Uh, operational management, a bit in the middle. <clears throat> People are sort of thinking, you know, they may or may not be. Um, the functional team is a, is, is a bit the same. And then we've got some technical things like architects and planners with a bit of in. And then subject matter experts at the end. Now, there can be a whole range of people. But again, a fairly um, uh, strong distribution to, um, you know, uh, having, um, uh, having some role or having a significant role in that space. 
So that's interesting. I'm surprised a little bit, which is good. Um, and then finally, our work procedures and work methods are design uh, product. And I've got, I'm um, saying, you know, roughly 72% of you are saying uh, that they are and 27%. I'm, I'm nearly looking at this final graph and thinking my, my work is done today. Uh, is that uh, I've convinced you about the importance of uh, design uh, in the process. So um, there we go. If people can, can feel free to continue to do that. I'll be very interested to see um, the final outcome of that. So what my proposition is um, as part of the uh, discussion today is that human-centred design should be our primary safety tool. So design should be um, central uh, to our thinking. And we're going to look at um, some of the processes and um, what design thinking is and, and how it works. So I've got a um, um, another quick um, form for you to do, and it's simply um, a question in relation to these doors. Now, uh, the Norman door link has been put into the chat. So if you could give this form um, a try now, and it's simply a question, you've got an image in the form um, for door one and door two, it'll come up. And we're simply going to ask you on uh, those doors as to what do you do when you walk up to that door? Um, do you uh, push to um, open that door or pull to, to open the door? So uh, we'll take a, um, a quick sample um, of that and see, um, and see what we get in that space. And... Um, Obviously, you know, it's not terribly important what it's uh, right or wrong in this space, but I'm just interested in your perception. The reason we're putting this question as we take this sample, we're getting quite a few results uh, in now. We're saying, okay, door one, most people are saying, are saying that it's a pull and it's a, it's a push, 31% um, saying. So with nearly 70% saying uh, door one, uh, is um, a pull and same door two um, uh, again very strong response you know, seventy six percent now coming in at saying that uh, door two um, uh, you would pull that uh, door let's have a look door one is a push and door two is a pull now these are these are what um, are known as Norman doors and. It's a really interesting thing. I'm going to introduce you in a moment to um, Don Norman, and Don Norman will explain um, uh, the reason that he, um, he came up with this concept of a Norman door. And a Norman door is a door that um, is counterintuitive in, in essence. When you come up to the door by the way it's designed, it actually ends up you uh, interacting with it in the wrong way in some form. So I'm going to share you um, a video now with uh, uh, on, a, on the, the Norman doors, and we'll explore this concept a little bit more. There's this door on the tenth floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it! You ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? I feel like Roman Mars would know about this. This is 99% invisible. And those doors you hate are called Norman doors. Um, what's a Norman door? Don Norman wrote the essential book about design. He is the right. Norman of the Norman door. All right, and where is this guy? You must go to San Diego. Okay. Hi. Hi, Joe. Hey. I'm Don Norman. I'm, gee, you know, it's hard to describe what I am. Well, he's been a professor of psychology, professor of cognitive science, professor of computer science, a vice president of advanced technology at Apple. But for our purposes. I was spending a year in England and I got so frustrated with my inability to use the light switches and the water taps and the doors even that I wrote this book. If I continually get a door wrong, is it my fault? No. In fact, if you continually get it wrong, is a good... And if other people continually get it wrong, 
Good sign that it's a really bad door. A Norman door is one where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. Why does it need an instruction manual? That is, why do you have to have a sign that says push or pull? Why not make it obvious? It can be obvious, if it's designed right. There are a couple of really simple, basic principles of design, and one of them I'll call discoverability. When I look at something, I should be able to discover what operations I can do. The principle applies to a whole lot more than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today, you look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once or twice or even triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today, commonly known as user or human-centered design. So that's the introduction to Don Norman and the concept of Norman doors and the um, the creation of the concept of um, human. There's this door on the Sorry. 10th floor of the Vox Media. Okay, I'm just going to give you another uh, short clip uh, from Don, uh, Don Norman, who's now going to explain the, the concept of what human-centered design is. The principles of human-centered design apply even if you don't follow the process of human-centered design. Because what are the principles? Well, the first one is the be human-centered. Focus upon the people that whatever you're doing is intended for, whether you're doing a service or a product or an organizational structure or a new way of, I don't know, stocking the warehouse or putting things on shelves. Whatever you're doing, always think of the people and all the people, not just the people, say, who are going to retrieve the items you put in, but the people who have to put the items up there in the first place. And if you're in the healthcare system, you have to think about patients and their families and the physicians and the nurses and also the medical personnel and the technicians. And for that matter, even the people who do the scheduling and clean the place. You have to think of it as a system and look at all of the components. That's a second important thing. Find the right problem. Almost always when somebody gives me a problem to solve, I refuse to solve it because it's not the right problem. It's the symptom of the problem. And I want to solve the fundamental basic problem because if I can solve the basic problem, guess what? The symptoms disappear. But that's not always so easy and it can take a lot of time. And even though I argue strongly, you should always try to solve the fundamental root problem. Sometimes it's okay just to solve the symptoms. And finally, you have to think of everything as a system. Everything is interconnected. So if you solve this tiny little piece, well, that's kind of nice, but sometimes optimizing each of the small pieces gives an inferior result. Optimization of the local does not mean global optimization. And so we should always be thinking of the big picture. What is the final result we can? The principles of human-centered design So um, Don Norman introduces these concepts. The first thing that he starts to talk about is this idea of discoverability and feedback. So what he's, what he's referring there to is that when you interact with something, whether it's a machine or a process, and we see this all the time within our workplaces where we have people operating complex systems and we can think things like mobile plant and all sorts of things that, that are happening in that space. Um, if, um, if, an, if an action uh, is required for interacting uh, um, with a, a piece of equipment or a process or, or whatever, it should be immediately obvious of what you should do. So like the Norman door, it should be immediately obvious that you should push or that you should pull from that process without having to get instructions to do so. And, and the second principle that you talked about was um, this idea of feedback, is you should get immediate feedback as to whether the action you're taking is actually the intended action uh, that, that's occurred. And there's lots of ways uh, that this happens. And the other, th the three principles that he was highlighting there are, are really important to our thinking and our thinking about you know, how work is done. 
is firstly be human centered you know come it from the perspective of those that are doing the work interacting with the process um, rather than if you like the organization or um, uh, or the or, or the purpose of the process that's occurring when we're thinking about the design process we need to focus on people and what they need um, his um his, his next thing is, is quite interesting finding the right problem and um so often the problem that uh, we're looking at is not the right problem to be uh, that we need to address. And this happens, I think, a lot in the safety domain. We, we're driven by incidents and a range of uh, different things that occur. And often we get to, um, redirected to be looking at the thing that's not the right problem, not the underlying lying, uh, uh, cause of, of what we need to address. And we end up treating the symptoms. And we do that a lot in our process, you know, more procedures, more training, more, you know, a whole range, more discipline. There's a whole range of things. We treat the symptoms rather than solving the problem that's led um, led to the issue that we're dealing with. And, and finally, he is very, you know, um, keen for us to understand that everything's a system and we have to understand how things fit into that bigger system and we need to work um, with, with that bigger system. So I just want to take you into um, uh, one final um, uh, oversight of this to show you um, what this design process uh, looks like. So I'll introduce you to this video. Back in 1971, a designer named Victor Papanek wrote a book called Design for the Real World. The premise was pretty simple. Creators could take some of the same design strategies from the creation of industrial products and use them to tackle problems like pollution and overcrowding and food shortages. By 2001, IDEO had done just that, pivoting from products to real-world experiences. But the design steps? Tim Brown says they stay just about the same. The first piece is observing the world in order to ask an interesting question, right? I mean, and you can observe the world in lots of different ways. When we talk about human-centered design, we're really talking about observing the way humans live their lives and asking interesting questions about, hey, why does somebody do this and not that? Or why is somebody struggling with this problem? Why, why is it hard for somebody to open that? Uh, 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 struggle, are they, why are they struggling to open that jam jar lid? Well, so maybe I could redesign the jam jar lid, right? Or maybe I could give them a tool to help them, right? So. So why is this happening? So the first step is that uh, looking at the world and coming up with a good question. For making a mouse, that means watching how people use computers and observing what they want and what they don't. For designing a school, that meant spending a month in Peru, meeting with students and parents, teachers, investors, government and business leaders to address needs like academic planning, modular classroom space, accessible technology, and affordable tuition. The next step is taking all the insights you have about those questions and starting to imagine ideas, like here's what I could do, here's what I might imagine doing better or differently. So that's what we often call ideation or idea making. Then comes the fun part. You test it out. Right at the beginning of the process, that might be a really simple cardboard model or a quick sketch, or if it's digital, it might be a quick digital simulation or something. And you try it out with people. Sometimes those drafts can be pretty rough. The first prototype for the mouse was a roll-on deodorant stick and a butter dish from a Palo Alto Walgreens. And you test it and see, it, and it doesn't work. Okay, so I need to rethink my idea and I do it again, right? And this is where the iteration comes in, right? You, you learn from the prototype, you realize what's not working, or maybe it's a crummy idea, you have to go back and find a new idea again. And you go through that loop over and over again, asking the question, having ideas, prototyping, learning, and, and until you get to something that truly meets somebody's needs or a set of people's needs. Now the only, the, the last bit of the process which, which arguably happens in that iteration also is the storytelling piece, right? Because always you're trying to explain to people why, you're, why your idea is interesting. Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. I think what you need to design a complex system is not one brain, you need lots of brains. You need lots of brains with different perspectives, different creative contributions that they make, working together to get to an outcome that is that is literally rich enough and sophisticated enough to be able to behave like a system instead of being like an object. Back in so that um, gives us an insight uh, into the process and this is 
the centre of um, the human-centred design model, this idea of um, observing ideation, um, exper experimenting uh, and testing. But also key to this um, um, process um, is this idea about um, storytelling. Um, in essence, to arrive at a good design, uh, we need to understand the importance of why change is required, the nature of the experiences um, of people in that space. And in all this process, it's all about having people at the centre of, of this process uh, and this particular uh, method. So um, I just thought I would show um, a couple of examples, you know, of, of simple ideas of design thinking and uh, of the impact that it has. And there's lots of stories um, around the space. So one could be the simple example of the automatic teller machine uh, when it was introduced. When the automatic teller machine was uh, first introduced, um, it uh, had a method that the cash was dispensed um, before the, the card was dispensed. So what was uh, routinely happening uh, in the process when people went to an automatic teller machine, um, they would put their card in, they would do the transaction, the cash would be dispensed, they would take the cash and then leave the card in the machine. And that was because really their objective had, had been met. The simple redesign, the, the simple um, uh, change to uh, that, that process was um, it required you to take the, um, take the card before you took the cash. And you notice that in all automatic teller machines at the moment, when you complete your transaction, you're required to remove the card and then the cash is dispensed. That's an example of just the thinking about human-centered design and actually making it intuitive and obvious about what are the steps that you need to do without having to follow a particular instruction. Now, design thinking. Um, if you want to um, invest, you know, learn more about, uh, about this space, the, the center of it is the uh, Stanford Design School. Um, it, it provides excellent resources in the public domain um, and really you know, provides great uh, insights into that process. Now, one of the points that was being made in the previous um, video is also the importance of many brains in the process. So in terms of when we think about, you know, um, getting good design and thinking about how we, we design work better, the more that we tap into um, a range of different thinkers, and particularly the people who do the work, uh, is central um, to getting a successful out outcome in this space. Now, in Stanford, you know, what they're um, very keen about is this um, idea of empathy, of actually emerging into the, um, the lived experience, you know, of the user. So for in our context, that is, you know, at the front line where work has been done. Um, it's important if we're going to think about using the design process to design better ways of doing the work um, that uh, are more intuitive, uh, that uh, actually interact and, and meet the needs of people in that space. We have to address the, these questions. If you're standing in that lived experience, you know, um, what, what is the, um, uh, the worker's um, thoughts or feelings about, you know, what do they confront? What's in their mind? Uh, what are they hearing, you know, in the space? What are they seeing? You know, what can they say and do you know, in terms of, you know, what are the limits and constraints about interactions? And ultimately, the, the pain and gain um, equation is basically in this in, in interaction, you know, what fears and frustrations do they face and what are they hoping to get and what does success look like? So this gives you a frame um, uh, to work from. And this is very much based around the principles of uh, appreciative inquiry. So the lenses of appreciative inquiry enable you to actively engage uh, in this space of the lived experience. Once you're in that space of empathy, you can then move into um, uh, the, the method for design thinking. And uh, the steps that you go through is this first phase. And we would, we would sort of talk about the, the empathise piece as uh, the discovery piece, is going out and doing discovery where work is done, standing in the shoes of those that do, do the work. Um, interviewing people, getting a range of insights uh, in a, um, and opinions. The next piece is they're then actually trying to define the problem. 
um, that, that you're working on. So you go through a process in, uh, you might use you know, there's different techniques like um, personas and looking at role objectives and looking at um, the challenges and trying to think what's, what are we trying to achieve in this uh, piece of work um, that's happening and what's helping or hindering in this space. <clears throat> Once you've gone through that, that process, you can then move into um, the ideation space. Now, I'm going to um, introduce you into a very important process that sits between these two things. What's really important in design thinking is not to come to the process when we're trying to improve, um, uh, if you like, the success and safety of work with the solutions in mind before you start. You need to immerse in the experience. You need to step away from um, the hindsight thinking and the preconceptions. But there's some structural methodology that's really important. And once you're in the ideation space, then you, you need to leave that to be a very open-ended space and, and make that rich and unconstrained. You can then move into a process of thinking about, well, what are the ideas we'd like to do some micro experience, experiments on? You know, here's some things. Let's try this differently. Let's put it into a safe space um, and let's test it out and get some feedback. And then once we go in the feedback, we'll find the, um, from that output, you know, what are the impediments? What's uh, working or not working? What are the changes that we need to adapt? And then, if you like, rinse and repeat um, that process. So if you're bringing this into you know, um, a, a design-centered model, thinking about you know, how we would apply this, and this is the type of model that we use in learning teams, uh, for example, is having this concept of let's, let's have a rich discovery, get better um, input um, to work from, move into the analysis space of having good data to work from, and then go into the ideation space and improvement space. So the idea is, is thinking about, and interesting on, and in our experience, we've, we've added this first step into the process is, you've got to have a capacity to innovate. So if you can't enter into using design-centered thinking if you haven't got some sort of organizational construct that is open to change and challenge and doing things differently in the space. Um, so you might have to create that space or you might have to get some permission in that space, but then moving in that process and then thinking about doing your appreciative inquiry and listening, immersing, immersing that space. Um, and then you can start to, you know, um, expand out on your definition and then tighten it up into that process. And same with the ideation. You then let's see how wide we can go and then we can tighten it down into our prototyping. And, this, and, the same, and then the same process is, once we go through this process, we get to a working model, it gives us the ability to then to actually, well, let's actually take this out and deploy it more broadly across um, the organisation. Now, um, Don Norman then takes this into um, a more systematic approach. Um, what, what he calls this is the Norman 21st century design, which um, he refers to as service design and using a concept of service uh, blueprint. And going, going back and touching on what Don was saying um, uh, in the videos, is this concept of consider all users in the transaction. So we need to think about in our working environment, there's a lot of different users uh, in, in that space. Now we'll have clients in, in that space. We'll do have different uh, teams working uh, in that space and they might interact in, in some way or another. We've got management needs in that space. We've got functional needs in that space. So when you're talking about this service blueprint, you're talking about this wider um, idea. And Don Norman's idea about service blueprints is trying to visualize things. It's, in the design thinking, visualization is a key strategy and tool that um, uh, is brought throughout um, uh, this, this process. Um, and look, look I'll, I'll just come, um, I'll just touch back, and I've seen one of the questions uh, in, in the chat um, about the difference between appreciative inquiry and humble inquiry. And really, the, um, the, the sim very similar things, you know, um, one, um, I, I suppose. Uh, the origin came out of, of humble inquiry and has been adapted in some process around appreciative inquiry, but they're very similar in process. So you can interchange the term humble inquiry, appreciative inquiry, I think, without any problem. Um, so, um, so within the service blueprint model, uh, what Don Norman talks about is this concept of creating um, customer journey maps and 
Um, I'll give you, I'll show you just an example of what this looks like. So the idea of having a journey map is thinking about, well, firstly, what's the scenario that we're looking at? So in a work, um, uh, in a safety context, we're thinking about a particular transaction of work. Uh, that's um, happening. Again, we recommend in using this model be as tight as possible. Don't get too broad uh, in that context. Keep your scenario and your transaction fairly limited as, as doing a very specific transaction in that space. You'll get better results in that context. And in that context is understanding well, what are the goals and expectations of this particular piece of work. The next part of the, the zone B, the experience, is that process of actually stepping through the transaction go through from you know, a process point of view, all the points of transaction, then start to understand, well, what are the interactions that are at each of these different points? Who's involved in those, those interactions? What's helping or hindering in those particular space? And you start to build a storyboard up of what the actual process looks like and what the, what the lived experience is uh, in that particular place. Once you've got this information, you can then move into the opportunities, which is the ideation um, space. So you're moving into that context with better data to work from and working from the data of the user that's uh, in, in this space. I think what we do a lot in safety is we make assumptions about the users and their experience, particularly if we're designing safe work method statements and, and the like and a lot of other these things. It's often done by subject matter experts who aren't involved in the lived experience. I might have had some interactions, but you really need to come in from that lens of empathy and, and undertake this process. But also in the ideation piece is, again, thinking about more brains are good in this space, is actually getting um, that input from the people, the, the, the users who do the work, um, the people who are invested in this in some way, but also then that's when you can use some of your subject matter expertise is to give your subject matter experts better information to work from and generate different and, uh, uh, and real ideas uh, in that process. And this whole process is about generating ownership uh, in, in that model. So, so you can do this in, like I said, in discrete transactions. And what um, once you start to look at this from a system point of view, um, you end up in this uh, concept of a service blue, blueprint. And what um, uh, using a design, uh, human-centered design model, you start to plug the journey maps together. You start to understand um, where the different journey maps uh, link into, what the dependencies are between the two things. And again, it's important from the, um, uh, from the Norman model of this process is not to do things in isolation. Uh, I think we have a history of doing that in safety. You know, if you think about our approach to incident investigations and a range of things uh, of the like, we tend we, we we tend to do our transaction without the wider consideration of this process. So, the idea is is trying to build this up, and then it helps you in actually from a resource point of view, from a decision making point of view of the leadership and the re, uh, and everyone else who might be functional. Uh, management needs to evolve is you start to get um, a process to think about where the opportunities lie to get the best result, both from um, a productivity point of view and a safety point of view um, as you, you lead into that process. So when we think about um, this process, you know, working in real time, we, we think about the question of the need is critical um, in this essence is um, you, when you do a, um, a, a human-centred design in, intervention, it has to be desired, firstly, by, um, by the users in that space. There has to be some real need to do something to make the investment in that space. And it, once you've got that desire of the end users and, and also the management teams in the space, that will drive the commitment um, through, that, through that process. Uh, we've talked a bit about the discovery about standardised, but one of the things that we think is that is really important in this process is once you collect your discovery um, piece and you start to do do that immersion, is allow time to process that. So you separate out that process of the discovery before you go in to solve the problems. And this is a bit about giving people time to engage. You might be able to find additional information uh, and the like. And then we go into um, the process that we've talked about in terms of um, thinking about the way that we analyze. And there's different, there, there are a range of different methods and tools 
um, that you can apply in that analytical process, um, but it needs to be um, a method that is uh, relevant to uh, the uh, uh, the particular in, uh, um, the the particular work process that you're trying to examine uh, and approve. So I'm going to just step this out and make the connection now with um, uh, our human factors thinking. Um, and what I've um, put up here is uh, when we start to design, well, how do we put this uh, concept into place when we're thinking about safety critical matters? We went back to, and this is the Western Australian a model for the Department of uh, Minerals and, uh, and uh, uh, Energy um, on the, uh, um, the factors that need to be considered. When, when, it's interesting when we look at this um, and we test it against the human centered design model, it comes up a little bit short um, in that process. Um, there are some elements that are quite um, relevant, but it's not really coming at, uh, at from the, the process. Now, there's some uh, good elements in this around, you know, the usable procedures uh, uh, and the like, but a lot of it tends to have a bit more of an organisational context. So it's not to say that these things aren't relevant, uh, but in, in terms of thinking how we actually understand and drill into the user experience, we need, need to uh, make some, some adaptations. So in the way that we've thought about this, we've come about um, this idea of trying to understand um, the work is done um, and looking at you know, controls with uh, human-centred design in, understand, in adding in this concept of uh, thinking about human dependency, use experience and human factors. And taking some input is how, how do we apply the concepts that have come out of the Stanford School uh, into this space? So the first thing is when we go back and look at the organisational factors piece from our, from our initial model, there are actually four things that are really important to understand from the user experience piece is um, what's the dependence um, that the, the process has on procedures and work routines? How does it depend on you know, training and competence? How does it depend on planning and resource? And is it dependent on the maintenance conditions of the particular process that, that they were looking at. Then secondly, as we come into this uh, thinking about um, human dependency and human factors, um, we really start to get interested into this user experience piece and plugging that um, into the model. So um, the, under the Stanford Design School, when they come in and talk about the user experience uh, in this human-centered um, design thinking, this is the test that they're looking to, to apply to the process. If they're looking at, um, uh, um, at the process that's working, they want to know firstly, uh, and if we think about this as a procedure um, or a work method in this space, these questions from the end user perspective is, is it, is it useful? Is it usable? Now, is it um, findable? Now, that, that's a bit um, of the Don Norman piece about discoverability in terms of if you're meant to do something or interact with something or use something in that space, it's immediately obvious um, and present uh, in, in that interaction. Is it credible in that space? Um, so do the, do the users of this think this is a credible procedure or process to, um, to be working with? Is it desirable? Is there something things, this is something we really like? you know, and think that we need to have this in place. The accessibility question is a really interesting one. We find a lot that we do in safety is uh, buried and there's a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, process that is produced, but it's very hard to access, and particularly if you're a contractor in this space. And then finally, you know, uh, is it considered to be valuable um, as a resource, a tool, a process or whatever? So we've, we've looked at that. Um, and uh, started to apply that uh, into this process. So what I'm going to do is share with you um, the, um, the last video that I want to share with you. But um, I want to share with you a real world example of taking this process into place. Um, and this was uh, done coming out um, of a process of trying to understand and apply human centered design and uh, the user experience to fix a problem with um, neonatal feeding in an intensive care um, hospital um, uh, in, uh, in, in the USA. And uh, I'll just, um, this video will tell, tell the story. The issue uh, being that um, in this particular intensive care unit, 
um, where the babies were in intensive care, the mothers were not at hospital, um, in the hospital, they left the hospital, um, but the, they were providing um, uh, they were providing the milk for feeding the babies and there was an issue in the milk being given to the wrong babies in that process. When babies are born with complications, they usually wind up in neonatal or paediatric intensive care. Mothers and babies are routinely separated for weeks or even months. Babies in care can still get the benefits of their mother's breast milk, but sometimes things can go wrong. We had two milk banks, or have two milk banks, and one functioned very fluidly and one was starting to have some real challenges and it had kind of um, a couple episodes where wrong milk had been delivered or and or administered to a patient. The topic became, how do we address wrong milk delivery? This is Jordana Goldman. She's a pediatric specialist based in Texas. For the heart center, and then was working kind of also on the hospital-wide level to advance safety science within the institution. When errors, like this mix-up with the breast milk, continually crop up in healthcare, institutions typically see this as a problem with their operational systems. Most often, they turn to health administrators and systems experts to fix it. But frequently, their recommendations simply increase the day-to-day -day burden on healthcare workers, while doing little to prevent these errors from happening again. The models that we've been working with, which are just more regulations, more box checking, more confinements, really haven't made significant progress. And if anything, sometimes just impedes people's natural ability to do their work and to be able to make the adjustments that are needed to get that good outcome or what we're driving towards. And so as we're learning about this and we're seeing this event unfold, and it seems so simple, but it just keeps happening. It raised us to, it made us think like, could we look at this differently? Is there more here? Jordana wanted to take a different approach. One that harnesses the expertise of those actually doing the work. Learning teams is an improvement concept that's about bringing people together and learning from the people who are on the front line every day. It's about learning from those who know what is working well and what makes their job harder or less safe. How much you interact with the people who are doing the frontline work and in what ways you're interacting with them can really significantly out affect the output that you get from that methodology. And if, you, if you're not asking, then you may miss a really crucial point. We started with choosing who would be the facilitators for the group. Um, we had two of our patient safety specialists um, who are nursing trained uh, be the initial leaders. And then I joined on kind of as a content expert. expert. <laughs> In a learning team, it's essential to get people who regularly do the task you're analyzing. But the team has to be a mix of people with different degrees of experience. The perspective of long-term employees versus short-term employees can really be quite varied. No supervisors or leaders, they are the recipients of the learning team, not the participants. The value of having non-content experts in the field asking the questions because the curiosity is just more native and because we just ask very simple questions that don't make sense to us that make sense because you're so used to being there. Like these assumptions that you've lived with they don't exist with the strangers who are entering your environment. So when a stranger comes and says, well, but why are you always only turning left? And they're like, oh yeah, my right blinker is broken. You're like, oh, okay, great. Do you want to fix it? So we discovered that setting up a three hour meeting in a healthcare environment wasn't a thing. So what we ended up doing, knowing that we only had an hour, was we decided to just start with, tell me about your everyday. Once they started talking, uh, they filled up that hour very quickly. Once this process began, a lot of powerful insights started to emerge. These insights were not part of the administrator's recommendations, and in fact, really ran against them, but were nonetheless grounded in the common sense of those at the coalface. 
The learning team developed a simple and ingenious way to lower the chance of a mother's milk going to the wrong baby. An elegant solution that went beyond the administrative status quo. They weren't quite exactly using um, true two step verification for, or two true patient identifiers. So one of the patient identifiers that we classically use is last name. Using that as a patient identifier is kind of a, um, an opportunity for um, loss in, in your checks and balances because there's going to be a bunch of Goldman babies potentially and it no longer is significant. So what they had had before was somebody's full last name and then their full medical record number. There were a lot of errors, I think, because people were using the full last names and just putting it in the bits. The solution involved taking the first three letters of the surname and combining it with the last three digits of the MRN. And so when they took away the full last name, so you couldn't just pick Goldman, um, and had to look for something else that last for the MRN that had actually decreased their work burden and increased the likelihood that it would end up in the right bin. This solution taps into something cultural. Looking at surnames, often the same surnames, day in, day out, creates a risk of a mix-up. So rather than full surname, full MRN, this solution involves taking less information, but combining it into something that forces us to take a second look. The learning team's solution really forces hospital staff to passively perform a two-factor authentication every time they look at a label. When the administrators come in and the engineers come in and they look at it, they think this is crazy because they don't think about the human factors piece of it. It's a solution that didn't come from the experts. It came from giving a voice and listening to those carrying out the work. When babies are born with complications, they Yeah, so I'm, I shared that example because um, it, it, it's a really interesting uh, example um, that uh, is having a significant uh, effect. And it's actually that the solution that they came up with um, in that uh, environment will not only apply to that process, but um, apply to a whole range of other issues about um, the importance of correct identification in the healthcare um, environment. But it came from this process of using human-centered design um, and uh, work, working through um, that uh, as an example. Um, now, I was going to give um, a, um, one, one more example, and this is just uh, an example. Of, it came out of uh, the mining industry, but again, a process where there had been a, sig a significant issue um, in that process. And just let me just fix my screen here uh, for a second. Okay, that should be um, better. So um, this was a process which has been had been a pretty standard uh, methodology for building um, a high voltage electrical transmission um, towers. And you can see uh, the method is to construct this tower by using a helicopter uh, into this um, space. You can see the workers mounted on the tower. And the idea being is that um, as the tower is uh, lowered into place, that the workers there manually guided uh, on and uh, secure it. Um, and it's been and it's been an industry practice, for, you know, for, for many years uh, to do it this way, and also had resulted in a number of serious injuries and, and fatalities. And um, when this was challenged, you know, to, to come out and think about this process, the um, the, the methods that we talked about is. Uh, firstly, um, immersing with, um, with the, the team, the, the end users who do this process of actually fitting the towers um, uh, or fixing them together, um, they came up with a whole range of uh, diff different ideas saying, well, um, they didn't understand that why couldn't the engineers come up with a process which would actually guide um, the tower components into place and didn't require a person to be at that point of transaction. Uh, in that space. And um, in essence, you, and you can see here's the process showing, you know, what they were doing in real time. And I think it's fairly obvious, you know, the risks that um, they were working for uh, with uh, in this particular process. 
Um, what they did was they came up with a design change um, by talking to the end users. And this came from the workers themselves and then working with the engineers. And they said, well, there must be a way that we can actually de uh, design a guiding bracket um, where we can actually lower down and it self-locates um, the uh, next stage of the tower uh, into the point of assembly. Uh, and, uh, and that was um, uh, basically uh, what was done in that space. And um, as a result, it, um, uh, it changed uh, the way, way that that work was done completely. So in essence, the, the, um, the tower stage was lowered in and then the, uh, the fitters were then secured into place after the helicopter uh, was no longer uh, in position and you didn't have that issue of the dynamic load that was in place. So I'm going to um, pause there. I think uh, hopefully I've given you some, some insight uh, into the process of um, using the, these ideas. It's a very powerful way, but I think the proposition that I'm really trying to um, position here is that using the tools of human-centered design and thinking about design thinking is not just about what happens before things arrive into the workplace. Um, it's very much about how equipment, tools, work methods, and all these processes um, are conducted um, and how we design that interface. What dependencies do we put in place? If we're using things like um, procedures and training and skills and controls, is constantly challenging that, thinking about can that be done uh, differently? Um, can we uh, get uh, different ideas uh, from those that do the work? Um, and in essence, we have this constant uh, challenge to, uh, uh, to improve and, uh, and uh, develop safe and successful uh, workplaces. So at that point, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, skip to the end, sorry. And open up if uh, anyone wants to put any um, questions um, uh, into the, the panel, happy, happy to take some questions. We do have uh, one question here, Calvin, from Vanessa, who says, uh, this is great stuff and we've repeated it for years e.g. to look beyond the symptoms, but why do we not? What do you think the barriers are to shifting people's practices? Um, look, I, I've thought a lot about this. I think it's because it's hard work, in essence. Um, this work of actually um, immersing and using these tools and techniques uh, is actually difficult to do in organisations. You, uh, you have to get uh, resources um, uh, deployed uh, into it. Um, it takes some effort. Um, it takes, um, there, there can be, you know, investment that's required from a, you know, a change in it might be um, capital investment that's required. It might be investment in people in that space. So I often think the reason we don't do it is it's, it's often simpler to stick to um, uh, the methods that we've used before, which is, you know, um, adding more procedures, you know, those sorts of processes, trying to solve the, the, the problem in the moment rather than in the deeper solution. So um, I think there's, it, it definitely takes commitment and effort to make this work. Yeah, awesome. Well, if anyone has any other questions, um, now would be good to pop them in the chat. Um, I'll just give people a, a few more seconds, but if no one has any more questions, um, from my point of view, from Marsha's point of view, I'd like to thank, you know, Calvin for his, for his time today. I'm sure everyone got a lot out of the presentation and hopefully we'll do a, uh, another one with uh, Calvin down the line sometime. Um, Calvin, do you have any, anything else to say? It's like a, a final sign-off or? No, great. Uh, look, um, we're, we're just very keen to uh, share these ideas and uh, I will be uh, even uh, more pleased to see, uh, you know, lots, lots more uh, um, efforts in the design space and using the tools of human-centred design. So uh, happy to share, happy for people to contact us, um, but uh, uh, there's lots of resources out there to explore it as well. So if I, um, success will be seeing more of these transactions in place. That's awesome. We're getting a lot of uh, feedback here now in the uh, chat panel saying it was very informative and, um, and, and thanking you, Calvin. So thanks again, everyone, for attending and um, we'll see everyone uh, next week for another webinar. Thanks, Calvin. Right, thank you.